Hi, folks. Welcome. Um, thanks. We uh, there will be no uh, projectile vomit in this uh, symposium. So if you want to move down, it's okay. Uh, but if I my stage dive could be kind of a problem. Anyway, welcome to uh, the Under the Radar uh, Professional Symposium. Thanks for coming. I'm Mark Russell, I'm the director of the festival and your host this morning, and it's great to see you all here. So many good friends, new friends. I want to mention that this symposium is being streamed live today. Come compliments of New Play TV. Thank you, David Dower and BJ Matthew and Polly Carl for putting that together for us. If you are not supposed to be here, i.e. your wife thinks you're in a tractor convention in Ohio, duck. That's all. Um, back in 2005, Oscar Eustace invited the festival to be a part of his inaugural season as artistic director of the theater, of the public theater. After seven years, amazing years, Under the Radar is now a core project of the public theater. Oscar's visionary leadership has brought the public to the center of the American theater world. It's a partnership I truly cherish. And it's great to work here beside Oscar and our new executive director, Patrick Willingham. It is my pleasure to introduce you to, as to welcome, Oscar Eustace. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Although um, it shows a really, really poor grasp of history to suggest that I put the public theater at the center of the American theater. One of uh, the things that I'm proudest of about this place is that this place, from the moment it started, was convinced that any ghettoization of artists was as destructive as ghettoization of people. Um, sure, Joe ran the New York Shakespeare Festival and founded the New York Shakespeare Festival, but then he opened this building with hair, the first thing other than Shakespeare he had ever produced. And we're standing on a stage that has been the proud home of Nature Theatre of Oklahoma and the original production of Chorus Line. And then and we closed King Lear on a few weeks ago. That wealth and breadth of work is what the public stands for. And, you know, the other thing that I feel like we're going to have to examine thoroughly is the um, truth value of the name under the radar. This is the least under the radar thing that we do at the public at this point. I think those big pictures in the Times sort of make the title illegitimate. But what's fantastic about that is the, the fact that the theater as an art form doesn't believe in walls, it doesn't believe in barriers, and it ultimately doesn't believe in people staying in their ghettos. It believes that everything is permeable, every act is a human act, and that Shakespeare and new musicals and new plays and cabaret and experimental work and independent ensembles and solo artists actually have more in common and more to learn from each other than they do by staying separate. And the beauty of having Mark and Mayen here as core members of the artistic staff of this theater is that that's being borne out in practice from uh, Mike Daisy to Terrell McCraney's work to Gob Squad. There are crossovers that are happening and cross-fertilization that's happening between the work that is not primarily based on scripts, between devised work, between you come up with the nomenclature, I'm sure you argue about it more than I do, but between that work that is not based primarily off of the work of a playwright and the work of this theater, which historically has been, there is a vibrant and wonderful dialogue going on. Nothing but good can result from that. We are honored to have under the radar part of the public. We're honored to have you here. We're incredibly grateful to everybody. I have to give a particular shout out to the Mellon Foundation. My deep love to Susan is here today who have been indispensable partners in all that we have done. And forgive me, anybody else I'm sliding, but I'm just, I, I just got to sing off Susan today. And um, welcome, and I think this is going to be a, a fantastic festival. Thank you. Um, for all of our formative years, uh, we were supported as a project of the Association of Performing Arts Presenters under the leadership of Sandra Gibson. 
APAP has a new boss, Mario Garcia Durham, uh, formerly of the NEA, and before that, the Yerba Buena Center in San Francisco. Mario, would you like to say a few words? Great. Thank you very, very much. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here among wonderful colleagues and old dear friends, uh, and young dear friends. Um, I want to give a special thanks uh, to you, Mark, for um, all the, the, the pleasure and joy we've had over the years of uh, working together um, on various projects. And now as I take my new role, I look forward to, to working with you. I also want to thank uh, Oscar and uh, the staff here, um, and all of you who make this symposium possible. Um, Arts Presenters has been a collaborator with Under the Radar since its beginning, and I want to I thank Sandra Gibson because I know she showed great leadership uh, in doing that and um, we're very proud of this association. I know that when I was at the National Endowment it was my great pleasure to support projects like this and I know we had an incarnation on the West Coast that we supported so I really love this work. Um, I think that the creation and support of new work is crucial to the vitality of the field and the cultivation of new artists which I hold to my core as being so extremely important. And support of this work is, is at the heart of what we would like to do on a constant basis as presenters, making new connections between artists and projects and audiences. And that is at the core of what we do. Um, I hope that you will take the work that you see here and spread it far and wide around the country because uh, in my position at the NEA, I saw how key projects like this were so critical to the sharing of new work, new ideas, new thoughts, new directions um, in the arts of this country. Um, I want to invite you to the um, speed dating session uh, tomorrow from 9.30 until 12.30 at the Hilton for more conversations. And um, I want to keep these comments brief, so have a great symposium, uh, festival, and conference. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Mario. Today's program and the whole festival would not have been possible without the support of people and organizations, many of them. First of all, I would like to thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and their continued support of our field. They have made it possible for UTR to flourish, and I thank Susan Fetter and Katie Turek and Diane Ragsdale for believing in us. The Ford Foundation has also been instrumental in supporting our work. Thanks to Roberta Uno and Darren Walker. The Henson Foundation has continued to ensure that my personal puppet habit is uh, <laughs> complete, and for that I'm truly grateful. I want to recognize the Trust for Mutual Understanding, the Adam Mikovich Institute, the Polish Cultural Institute, the British Council, Culture Ireland, the Marche Region of Italy, the Goethe Institute, and the National Performance Network for their support of the individual projects in this festival. And we could not be here without our partner venues. This year, it's the Japan Society, thank you, Yoko, here, Performing Arts Center, and especially down the street, La Mama. Our project partners this year are Performance Space 122, 651 Arts, Shea Wafer, and the LaGuardia Performing Arts Center. Thank you for all your support of these projects. There are many more to be recognized, and I hope you will take a moment before your shows to look at our sponsors, but if you poach them, I will find you. <laughs> um, I, uh, I must recognize the popular and fabulous public theater staff, who just as everyone else's season is winding down for the holidays, we ask them to step it up and do 14 shows in 12 days. You will meet all of our amazing interns who have been working on this festival since September. I want to recognize our legion of volunteers. These are artists, they're our future administrators, and probably our future funders. And I want you to meet our new employee, Andrew Kircher, who has been our production manager and consultant for many years, but now is an official associate producer of the festival. Andrew, are you in the room? Good, he's working out there. So. Um, and finally, well, not finally, 
But last and not least, my true partner in crime and punishment, Mei Yin Wang, my associate artistic producer. <laughs> this festival could not happen without her genius. This year at the symposium, we are focusing on our international side. In fact, we've gone all the way over to camp. Uh, thank you, Susan Sontag and called it the United Nations of Under the Radar. Um, hence, we got a carpet and some flag. Oh, they <laughs> um, consider yourselves delegates, but this does not mean you get uh, international diplomatic immunity. Um, we are facing a lot of uh, challenges in the US today, politically, socially, financially. We are headed into a year of presidential campaigns. Before that happens, I thought this was a good moment to examine our own situation through the lens of other countries, many facing similar issues. How are they dealing with the rise of right-wing politics? How are they dealing with changing generations and decimated cultural infrastructures? How are they dealing with burst financial bubble bubbles and its interesting, pernicious effect on free speech? Hearing their stories, can provide a perspective and clarity to our own struggles. We have a very full agenda. For the morning, we will be here in this room, the Newman Theater. We will not be taking a break this morning, or maybe a very short one. If you must visit the facilities, just excuse yourself, and a volunteer will show you to the way to the restrooms. I don't know if anyone knows. They're down towards Joe's Pub down this hallway. Um, first. We have some reports from abroad, UN style, and I ask each of these artists to address us and tell us about the cultural situation in their country, and also to speak about their vision of the future of theater. Please welcome, um, come on up to the stage, if you will, folks. Um, representing the nation of Italy, the artistic directors of Motus, Enrico Casagrande and Daniela Nicolo. Are you around? Come on. Um, the, representing the nation of Turkey, Aika Damgasi. <laughs> and Toshiki Okada. Um, I don't know what happened to the puppets. Okay. Um, so representing the nation of Italy, uh, the artistic directors of Motus, Enrico Casagrande and Daniela Nicolo. Motus brought us too late Antigone contest number two, which happened last year on this stage. It was such a powerful performance and resonated so much with our political cultural environment that we invited them to bring two other performances back this year, Alexis, a Greek tragedy, and The Plot is the Revolution, a collaboration with Judith Molina. Please welcome Enrico and Daniela. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So, uh, we try to speak about uh, our company, Marcus, and uh, your relation with ER in our situation. And sorry for our broken English, for sure you can understand and know what, but. All right. So, Marcus is a, a Latin word meaning movement, transformation, physical motion, and also motion of thought. The idea of movement involve all aspects of our independent artistic adventure. We began away from the great production centers that promulgate theater in Italy, but at the same time regulated and unfortunately put the brakes on. Now we are both here, me and Daniela. This tofu presence has always been at the heart of Modus. There is continual interchange of ideas and also in relation sometimes with a, a third reference, with whom we share a privileged dialogue. For the moment, it's Silvia Cardelloni, our Antigone. We set out of uh, our theatrical experience united by the love for Samuel Beck's writing, for his characters in continuous movement. This deconstruction of the text influenced our own way to see the stage, always avoid linear methods of narration, we create hybrid shows that often confuse even the critics. 
They didn't know where to place us. Is theater, is not theater? Good, good question, but just question. We have never liked to be defined our and or put in a box. For, for us, doing theater has always been a tool of knowledge and, and study. It isn't market, it isn't show, it's a life. It challenges the established order of things, create fracture, laceration, disorientation, and above all, poses questions. In 2000, after 10 years of work in an underground theater, completely without subsidies, we left our little rehearsal space and, and uh, start, uh, began a nomadic existence with a lot of residences in Italy and abroad and production all uh, over. Always changing the rehearsal space means that you have to restart each time, build a new house, never on the foundations of the previous one. For each new theater project, it's become more and more necessary to make an exploration trip, to begin work outside of the rehearsal room, to intercept material in uh, the world of things. I live in things, from Pierpaolo Pasolini poem. It is also the title of our latest book, about our travels between deserts and suburbs always deeper into contemporary junk space, to quote Ren Kulas, where you are unsure about uh, where you are, unclear about where you are going, and the place where you were has already disappeared. <laughs> so, again, the modus that animates us is movement, no escape, but openness to the unexpected. Let's reflect a little. Voyages and migrations lie at the origin of the entire history of the West. <clears throat> like those of Ulysses who left family and friends behind to begin an endless wandering. And Antigone herself leaves the palace to follow her father Oedipus on a journey without destination toward Nurpa, uh, as Henri Bouchot writes in his very fine book, Oedipus La Rue. Antigone and Oedipus are welcome and given hospitality everywhere today. Today they be rejects, illegal immigrants, subject to the law of zero tolerance. Openness to listening, to welcome the outside, the other, is more than anything else a prerogative of the artistic world. Someone described our theater as art of the outside, which doesn't mean to represent, rather to present itself, to offer itself, and we will add with joy. Gilles Deleuze defines joy as a sort of trampoline that helps us through something we might never have overcome. He uses a great metaphor about learning to swim, being unable to swim means that you, that you are at the mercy of the wave. The wave can drag you away, overturn you, but if you dive into it and emerge at the right moment, you can use its, its momentum to go further. There it is, in this synchronicity, synchronicity sorry, of movement with the outside lies a possible representation of artistic freedom, similar to the passion of a love. A passion which we found in the Greeks people, and which is perhaps being arose again in Italy, we hope, really, now. In, um, in Exarchia Quarter in Athens, we grasped that the only way we have to avoid pain for, for the crisis is to get out of the classic scheme of protests, to become ungovernable, to ourselves becomes their crisis. And this is also true for theatrical language. What's going to happen now? <laughs> the last question in Alexis, our performance. 
Alexandra, on stage, declares that in her view, the key lies in words she saw written on a wall in Athens. We come from the future. The ongoing revolts in Greece, the uprisings in North Africa, which are spreading all over, means that the presence of an extended and critical mass of young people, including artists, I hope, decided to wake up and shift the axis. They stand in the future because they are the future, a future which actually and Orwell paint in bleak shades, but may it have some surprise in store? And it's precisely the images of the future, including, including utopian ones, that we are dedicating our upcoming, our upcoming project, Making the Plot. A very tough challenge, but it's exactly, exactly when utopia becomes unimaginable that it is necessary. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Um, so, uh, representing Turkey is uh, the actress and producer, I'm, gonna, I'm tearing up her name, but she'll ha I'll have her say it when I check, um, yeah, her bad, uh, <laughs> who is bringing us Ozan Yula's Lick But Don't Swallow. I check is a film and theater actress in Istanbul and a pr producer. Lick But Don't Swallow is one of the most humorous and provocative shows in this festival. Please welcome I check. Okay, hello everybody. <laughs> um, of course, it's a big, big, big pleasure to be here. And, but first of all, I want to thank you, the playwright of this play, Özen Yula, and the very talented directors, uh, Biriken, Melis Tezgan and Okan Urun, and to this very beautiful festival, Under the Radar, who believed us, who invited us here, without their support and invitation, we won't be here. So I would like to thank these names, these people, uh, very much, because uh, if, they, uh, if they're not here, we won't be here. Um, so I want to give a brief, a very <coughs> brief picture about how Turkey is today and what kind of agenda we're in, with what, what kind of environment we're in, when we're waking up every morning in, uh, in that country. So like 70, more than 70 people, uh, of, uh, people living in Turkey and we have you know, borders with Iraq, Iran, Syria, Armenia, Greece, Bulgaria. So we're involved with their issues. And uh, more than 10 different languages spoken in uh, Turkey, like Turkish, Kurdish, Armenian, Greek Orthodox language, Greek, Greek language, uh, Arabic. Uh, but in the constitution it says the official language of Turkey is Turkish. Uh, and under the circumstances of the civil war since 30 years, many have been killed uh, or had to leave their home. And more than 16 million of people are the, under the uh, under poverty line. Poverty line. So you can hear variation of atrocities every day, but also since a couple of years, every day approximately five women are killed or beaten by their husbands or by men and more than 60 journalists have been arrested and hundreds of academicians have been arrested lately because of the, the uh, cooperation with terrorist organizations, whatever. So the, the army is bombing civilians and children. And uh, yeah, this is, the, this is the picture we're living in. So uh, while the political agenda is full of these uh, cases, uh, I want to, um, uh, I mean, uh, the all cultural, main cultural activities, theater activities, uh, er, they're going on in big cities, in Istanbul, in the capital of Ankara, in Izmir, a few big cities, but for the rest, for the rest, I must tell that there's a huge gap, huge gap between those cities and this region. So, then I want to give a little bit picture of the Turkish theater uh, uh, world. Uh, I mean, uh, like elsewhere in this world, there are mostly two main streams. The, the one, the government and the, um, uh, the national theater and the municipality theater, which is supported by government and local governments, which means you can have huge productions with high costs and all your actors are being paid monthly as government offices and, 
and they, they have to accept the given mission, whether they like it or not. So they exist in a convention, and they have always have the guarantee of audience. And so their report, repertory is uh, generally classics. And even when they stage some contemporary plays, you can sense a convention in order to reach more public, or you can see more public morals in these things. Well, regarding private theaters, uh, some of the lucky ones, they get subvention from the government regarding to their age and prestige, but uh, these monies are really uh, even not enough to cover but one production or uh, less. Uh, so the little groups, uh, which is which I'm a part of it, uh, who are staging more open and plays, they are, which are usually <laughs> stuck in the basements and in some tiny roof floors, uh, has the most potential, of course, and, and of course they are the pioneers of, I think, Turkish theater. Uh, and of course they suffer the most because of lack of money, and for example, if, and there's another thing, if they really want to sell their productions, uh, they usually promote for an eligible I mean, minority and make an in-your-face package. And, of course, the actors earn doesn't any money. They have to work in other jobs and mostly in TV. And, of course, this is another crisis for actors because P TV people even don't like actors who work in theater because, oh, they always have rehearsals. They, they complain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in, <laughs> in Turkey, so, yeah... <laughs> Um, in Turkey, the donation or the uh, support kind of networks, or they're not powerful as much as U U.S. Because, I mean, because people have other fundamental priorities, like living and eating, and, and so they don't they don't have the common idea that art is a fundamental need of societies. I must admit that. So this is the briefly the political and artistic picture. Uh, I don't want to make generalizations, but this is this is how what kind of darkness I am living in. So, so uh, after this, uh, after many years, uh, I ask myself, really, really, who for whom we are doing this business? Sometimes I ask myself. I mean, just I'm quickly skipping the answer to be able to express ourselves, to be able to have a space, of course. But who are the people coming to see our shows? I mean, if the audience are the ones more or less sharing the same political perspective or the people almost from the same socio-economical class, it means we're, we're making a little uh, glass menagerie and let's say a solidarity field in these tiny rooms uh, or basements. I mean, but how we can go, how we can move forward that, than that? I'm really after this question. Because do, do we still have the desire of changing things in this world? Uh, or is reflecting is enough for changing? Uh, and I think globally, we're in the age of concept, consumption with these isolation cell kind of uh, life models. Uh, we are watching massacres, genocides. Also, we're after big enter entertainment shows, porn movies. And in the middle of these extremes, what kind of theater we should be after? What, what is the form or what is the context? And actually, while we are preparing Lick But Don't Swallow, uh, we were all moved by these ideas. I mean, our really aim was to rock the same socio-economical background with people like us and the, I, for, for, to make a very humorous and provocative play. I mean, in a way, kind of negative print of the middle class people who doesn't want to change the world, but eating, you know, pizza, hot dog in front of TV, and uh, watching these uh, war-embedded uh, journalists, whatever. Uh, so, but unluckily, well, some of the you know or some of you don't know, we bumped into a huge conservatism because of the subject of the play. So Islamic uh, newspaper attacked us and targeted us. And it was such a shame. I mean, because the people who really wanted to attack the theater, are the theater we're going to perform, they are the people we were interested in their stories. They were the people who are helping us to carry the props to, uh, uh, to theaters, you know. The, 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 but then you see they are, their en they are your enemies. That was such a shame, I think. So how we prepared the play is we had zero money. Uh, the, I mean, we, we rehearsed.
first in a very, very uh, strange bar, uh, very, uh, in the coldest season with a few heating. And we had to wipe out the trash every morning. And, but that was okay. We, we worked like this. So, but in, in my, in my in, in for the young theaters in Turkey, uh, or the radical theaters, I observed something. Um, to, put up your, put, to put up yourself sincerely, and really in a sincere way, is an uptight program. And uh, this is also because of a totalitarian military structure in, in the Tur Turkish society and system. But also, I think it's also a little bit West and East issue, because I think it's a big habit to import from West since more than 100 years for, for Turkey. I mean, instead of exploring and sensing what is really going on in the collective memory or the communal subconscious of the society, theaters import formats, foreign texts, like this in your face things, what it, they, don't, they don't judge whether it suits the, uh, their own imagination or their own needs. So I think, I think confrontation is a very, very important word or and, uh, move, move. And societies and artists who's not willing to lance themselves will witness their annihilation. That's, this is what I believe. And, and the, another question, which is really on my mind since, since a long time, how can theater run out on streets? We can easily say that in Turkey, there could be at least 50 millions of people who never saw a theater play in their life, at least, so maybe 60. Um, so, um, I mean, how can we reach the shopkeeper? How can we reach to this bagel seller? Uh, this, is, this is on my mind. I mean, you can say I do high art, it doesn't interest me. Okay, I accept this, but, but today, um, I mean, in order to create a feast, feast and a, or a catharsis or a carnavalesque, uh, what do we do? What do we do? We only go to our little tiny rooms, dark rooms, and share this, our ideas, imaginations with 50 people. And th is that it? I ask myself. So even, even let's say, a feast example in New York, I saw in Gay Pride, uh, it, it, it become really commercial because uh, you see fences, borders everywhere. And uh, uh, there is, you, know, you can say there's a free speech, but I think there's a serious, serious categories and restrictions in the US, I can see this. I mean, so, also another thing, which provides as a, uh, as a space, the international theater festivals, and uh, I think this interaction and is very fulfilling, inspiring, it moves me a lot, really. But then, I, and I see artists start to, uh, they, you can find yourself in a position that you create for these festivals, so you start to sell your work. Then again, I, I ask myself, what is the function of the international theater festivals? Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, but is theater is going to be in a protected area of expression for an exclusive minority? Or is theater is a feast uh, uh, that you can search and unite with your comrades to move on. So, um, I mean, really, really, I am looking for this answer or questions. Uh, how we are going to find the inspiration to move on? I mean, how we are going to find the producers to believe us? Actually, in Turkey, there is no such a thing called producers in theater. So, if you want to create something, you have to be the producer. There's, there's no, there's no other uh, option. Um, I mean, yeah, maybe I, I pictured you a very dark uh, tunnel like the Kafka Kafka way. <laughs> but uh, for me, for me, really, theater people uh, should consider they are the shamans, they are the storytellers of modern times and. Theater people are the ones who feel the zeitgeist, the, the spirit of time, the, the, they, who they feel the massacres, genocide, atrocities of their age, and the collective memory of the universe. I mean, because the final level of becoming a shaman is to see that this big dream, you know, in this big dream, 
uh, that all your bones will be apart from each other and then reconstruct in your new spirit. Um, so I can see no other way than deconstructing ourselves, being critical, merciless to our beliefs, ideologies, the aesthetic forms that we constantly fed from, and turn the, our performances to a Dionysian uh, celebration. Thank you. I met Aika on one of those uh, USIA, I think that's the agency that, that came uh, and uh, she went where we, they try to <coughs> have artists uh, from abroad learn about American and how much better we run our art. And, um, and anyway, after about our short interview, uh, she gave us a little DVD and we went back and popped it in our, our uh, player that we have between uh, Megan and I. And uh, before she left the building, we were on the phone to find her and bring her back. So I'm so happy that, that uh, Lick But Don't Swallow is in our, our season. Um, representing the nation of Japan, is the writer and director, Toshiki Okada, who is, opens Hot Pepper, Air Conditioner, and the Farewell Speech at the Japan Society tonight. Toshiki is a true visionary theater maker, and I am very honored that he is able to be here today delivering his speech to us in English. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting us and our show to the end of the later, Mark. Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to tell you today is about how I have observed the current Japanese situation of Japanese theater and how I think it should be changed. This idea was so influenced by our experience of the recent disaster happened on March 11th in last year, and consequent catastrophe and uh, political disorder. Uh, Japanese contemporary theater is now struggling how to relate itself to the society. In other words, the contemporary theater is now being required to contribute to public interest, no matter which it is uh, by the intention or uh, as a result. I expect that Japanese theater makers would do their best uh, to look for the way to realize it. I have to say that Japanese theater has been lazy to make connection itself to the society. <clears throat> and also have neglected to be conscious of public interest. I think because nobody has cared if theater makers are conscious of society or public interest, and also because nobody has requested them to create a piece which has value to contribute to the society. As a result, all, almost all artists in my generation or younger have never had been seriously conscious of such a problem. But it doesn't make sense anymore to think it's okay to be politically ignorant just because such ignorance has been, has been the standard for a long time. Because of such a peaceful society, we Japanese theater makers have kept our mentality ignorant of interest to social, political, and public interest. The public states, however, the change of current mentality is required required to take place. It was provo provoked by the disaster. Japanese theater makers can no longer be indifferent to the potential of their work to connect to the society. It is a very unfamiliar situation for us. We never be conscious of such the issue ever before. There are two options ahead of us. One, is venturing to explore a way to contribute to public interest. The other is not reacting to this situation 
and distance oneself from the unfamiliar territory. I believe Japanese theater should take the former option. We are required to change and develop the idea about the public interest. Even if the disaster or nuclear catastrophe had not happened, that such a change is necessary. The society of Japan does not have much idea of public interest. We, theater artists, are remaining to be unfamiliar to think about contribution to public interest. While we are getting public support, it is quite a weird situation, but this weirdness is reality of current Japanese theater industry. It is not reality of current Japanese theater, but also of current Japanese society itself. But let's confine the topic to theater here. It is disease to leave this weirdness as it is, and it is impossible to preserve such a situation as it is. It's time to dump the notion that change is impossible. Unless artists in my generation were younger start developing the idea of contribution to public interest, the situation would never change. I hope it must be realized. I hope the disaster has worked as a crucial trigger for it. If we cannot uh, utilize this opportunity to change ourselves, we have to never excuse ourselves. The fact that we've neglected the idea of contribution to public interest is the negative things. However, I'd rather try to look at its posit positive side as the negligence is now giving our generation an opportunity to start from scratch to build up the idea about the issue of theater's contribution to public interest. If we do it well, uh, we can even develop our own way to connect arts and the society close together. Our own way, which is not only different from the one maintained in Europe, but even with stronger persuasive power. And thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so oh, that was going to be the end of our program, but there was this sort of email campaign, and I, I've had to uh, expand uh, the, uh, the 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 <clears throat> public addresses, and um, so uh, under duress, we've uh, put in this uh, project uh, representing the puppet nation uh, is Moses and his helpful entourage, a blind summit from the UK. Blind summit is known for their puppetry in Madame Butterfly at the Metropolitan Opera and their own inventive shows. The Table, which is at La Mama for only three or four performances now, uh, won several Fringe Awards at this year's Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Please welcome Moses.
three basic principles, uh, focus, breathing, and fixed point. Uh, first of all, focus. Uh, there is uh, two parts to focus. What I'm looking at, for example, you, Matt. <laughs> If they look at me, I am in focus. If they look up, I go blur. <laughs> <laughs> and when they look back again, I come back into focus. That's focus. And what that sort of does is make them look invisible and me sort of visible. Yeah. Focus. Now the second part is fixed point. Now this is a little harder to explain. Um, it shares something, I suppose, with mine, with the, with the, with the wall, the invisible wall. <laughs> um, the, the best way to demonstrate it is, refers to puppetry. The best way to demonstrate it is, is just to show you it wrong. So this is no fixed point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it looks pretty cool, um, but it's unrealistic, essentially. And, uh, 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 and, and of course, it creates a feeling of no gravity. to develop the art form, we need to invest 
and continue to do everything we can to encourage the performers, the puppeteers, to, 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 to take it as seriously as possible and, 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 and be able to do the work. Um, and uh, that brings me uh, finally to, to just say thank you to Under the Radar, because essentially it's, it's festivals like this inviting us uh, 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 to come and do this ridiculous uh, 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 things that we do um, and encourage us to keep experimenting and, and, and uh, uh, trying new things with Paris. Thank you very much indeed. Have a great festival. I'm really try to get the files from these folks and put them up on, uh, so you can read them on the uh, Under the Radar website. And now it's time for a very short break. Coffee is still in Joe's Pub. Um, I want to see you back here in 15 minutes. Thank you very much.